Well, welcome back to the Steve Max Muscle Car Show podcast. Uh, we are now sponsored by High Octane Classics, uh, the Northeast's largest muscle car and supercar dealership located at 143rd Washington Street in Auburn, Massachusetts, also known as 143 Washington Street in Auburn, Mass. Uh, High Octane Classics buys and sells and services muscle cars and exotics. You can call them at 508-859-4515. Welcome back to the Steve Bags Muscle Car Show. On this sixth episode, we finish up our Chevrolet specific facts with a look at the XP819 rear engine Corvette prototype, more Z28 production totals, and early V8 Chevy history. Let's get it started. Okay, to start it up with fact number 87. 1977 may have been a soft year for factory performance cars, but it was a landmark year in the Camaro Mustang sales war. For the first time ever, Camaro outsold Mustang 218,853 to 153,173, proving that downsizing wasn't necessarily the key to showroom sales. The Camaro Z28, returning after a two-year hibernation in 1977, accounted for 14,349 Camaro sales, or about 1 in 15, in 1977, but blossomed to 54,970 sorry, but blossomed to 54,907 units in 1978. And let's remember, when I speak about downsizing, I'm talking about the uh, third generation Mustang, which uh, followed the 1971 through 73, which was a very large Mustang. 74, the Mustang II, was that bizarre little car that basically was a Pinto with a Mustang suit. But check this out. The Mustang sold like hotcakes in 1974. The Mustang II, right at the peak of OPEC, the fuel crisis was the absolute right car at the time. Yeah, today we look back, we laugh at the Mustang II, but it outsold uh, but uh, Camaro outsold the Mustang. And again, that was the first time ever that the Camaro outsold the Mustang. And again, that happened in 1977. Of course, by 1977, the Mustang II was in its, what, fourth or fifth year of production, and its new car charm had worn off. And yeah, people started to say, okay, that Mustang II is cute, but I do prefer the bigger more real V8-powered Camaro, and sure enough, in 77, they spoke with their wallets, and Camaro finally outsold the Mustang. Okay, get on to fact number 88, more Z28 goodies. Here we go. Z28 production broke the 100,000-unit mark only once. The year was 1984, with 100,899 built. The next closest yearly output was 1986, with 88,132 built. But if we count the 49,585 new for 1986 IROC Z Camaros built, we get an unmatched total of 137,717 high performance V8 Camaros for the 1986 model year. While critics bemoaned the 1980s for bland economy cars, let's not forget that nearly 8 of 10 1986 Camaros were legitimate V8 performance models. Now, you know, here we are in 2020, uh, the IROC Z may seem like a pretty tame performance car in the light of the ZL1 Camaro of today, the crazy supercharged 6.2 liter and 7 liter monsters that we can buy now from Chevrolet. But in the mid-1980s, you know, the Tuneport 350, the Tuneport 305 uh, with their five-speed manual transmissions with the 305 or the automatic with the 350, they were as hot as things got. And yeah, they, they could run a 14-second quarter mile uh, with a set of slicks, uh, but for the most part, they were good for high 15s, low 16s. But that was fairly peppy. What those cars were really good at was handling, and they looked fantastic. So in the mid-1980s, believe it or not, the Camaro Z28 had its greatest performance and its greatest sales uh, sales numbers of all. Yeah, the 1960s and 70s were in distant second place. Yeah, people preferred those 80s Z28s, and I do too. Okay, moving from Camaro Z28 performance figures to Chevy pickup trucks. Yep, the SS454. Let's move on to fact number 89, which reads... Between 1990 and 1993, Chevy built 16,953 454 SS pickup trucks. Of them, the most common are the 1990 models with 13,748 made. Even though subsequent releases were improved with more power and fuel-saving overdrive, yearly sales plummeted. Only 983 in 1991, 1,379 in 1992, and a mere 843 in 1993. 
Across town, Ford's similarly themed lightning muscle pickup launched just as the 454 SS was being laid to rest. Though diehard Chevy fans rarely cross-shopped Ford products, the fact that 5,276 Ford Lightning sold suggests that more than a few would-be 454 SS customers were struck by Lightning. Some Bowtie fanatics ranked the 454 SS marketing miscue up there with the temporary corporate insanity of the 1975 and 76 when the Z28 Camaro was discontinued. So there you have it. Just as the SS 454 pickup was being laid to rest, Ford kicked in with its Lightning pickup truck. Now, and of course, the Lightning sales kicked in. So again, it's possible that a few guys who were ready to stomp and buy a Chevy 454 pickup said, man, they dropped that? Well, it's by a Ford. And it could well be that uh, Chevrolet lost those customers forever. And let's keep in mind, too, that the Lightning was powered by a 351 small block engine, whereas the 454 SS was powered by the big block Chevrolet. But again, these were the uh, mid-1990s when rear-wheel drive vehicles, passenger cars, just didn't exist. So car makers had to go to truck platforms to feed the high-performance market. Okay, moving from pickup truck facts to Camaro facts. Let's go with number 90. This is a quote from Car and Driver magazine. Here we go. When the stoplight turns green and accelerators flap to the floor, the Z28 is Emily Post polite. Everybody else goes first. End quote. Car... Car and Driver, January 1982, on the third generation Camaro's tepid performance. I remember back when I was a kid in 1982, I guess I would have been 22 years old. I was born in 64, so yeah, 22. Um, 22? Help me with this, Chris. Okay, 1964 to 74, 84. I would have been 18 in 1982. Okay, so I'm 18 years old. I still haven't learned how to add. But anyway, in 1982, I remember reading that in Car and Driver magazine. And there it said, when the stoplight turned green, everybody else goes first. Emily Post Polite. Now, I don't know who Emily Post is, but I think she wrote a book on, uh, on etiquette and being polite and how to eat at the dinner table. But uh, to say that the Camaro Z28 was that tame, that everybody else went first, Ouch! Now keep in mind that the Chevy Z28 was new for 1982, the third gen Camaro, and uh, of course it grew from strength to strength from there, peaking out, you know, with the L, uh, the the 350 tune port car of 1986, uh, 87, 88. Uh, but those first cars with the Crossfire injected 205, I think, horsepower, something like that, 160, I think it was, not a lot of power. So again, you know, Camaro grew from strength to strength. But in 1982, it was really easy to criticize, and car and driver sure let them have it with that. Nasty little quote. Okay, from Camaro factoids to a Corvette factoid, this is fact number 91. In a press release dated Tuesday, March 15, 1977, Chevrolet claimed the half-millionth Corvette rolled off the St. Louis assembly line at 2.01 p.m. the previous day, Monday, March 14, 1977. In reality, the car, serial number 1Z37X7S, 426583 was actually completed three days earlier on Friday, March 11th, 1977. Either in an oops, we almost missed it moment, or to ease the task of staging the press release photo, Chevy super detailed the car and put it back on the assembly line with number 500,000 lettered across the windshield for its historic photo session. Like the first Corvette, the half millionth was painted classic white with a red interior. It was delivered to Bernie Hout Chevrolet in Mount Clements, Michigan. So there you have it. Uh, you know, again, Chevrolet was very uh, cognizant of the fact that the half millionth Corvette was a very big deal, and they made hay with it. But again, there were two shots of that car coming off the line, March 14th and March 11th. You choose which the actual number one, which the actual number was. Uh, and of course, you know, since then, Corvette production, I think we've broken the million car mark. But in 77, 500,000 pieces or one half of a million, a pretty good number for a car that only seated two people and was made of fiberglass. Moving on to fact number 92, more Corvette trivia. In 1962, Chevrolet went looking for an early Corvette to restore so it could be displayed with the then new, for 63, Stingray. What turned up was number 155 of the 300 built in 1953. The car was restored by GM technicians in Flint, Michigan, and used for photography, car shows, and as a courtesy car before being sold to a private party. 
1967, Chevrolet was feeling nostalgic again and bought another 1953 Corvette, serial number 255 of 300 built, for restoration. They reportedly kept the car and placed it in the Sloan Museum after concluding its PR duties. I'm not sure if General Motors still owns car number 255, but it's ironic that 255 of the original 300 1953 Corvettes made are accounted for today. That's an amazing fact, really, because you think about that, 53, first year for the Corvette, it was something of a General Motors Motorama show car come to life, and they weren't sure how many they could really sell. So 300 cars were built, and check that out. Today, in the year 2020, 255 of those 300 cars are still on the planet. That's an amazing fact, meaning that, uh, what, 45 have been destroyed or lost to time. Pretty cool. Okay, more Corvette trivia with fact number 93. XP-819, the only rear-engine Corvette engineering test car, cost a reported $500,000 to build, but was purchased for a mere $7,000. How did it happen? In 1964, the Corvair development boss was Frank Winchell. Psyched about the rear-engine Corvair platform, he sold Duntov on the idea of a rear-engine Corvette test car. With an aluminum 327 small block hanging off the rear transaxle, the result was a tail-heavy and even its sleek Mako Shark-esque styling couldn't save it. Everybody moved on, and the XP-819 was set to be scrapped, until Smokey Yunnick stepped in claiming he wanted to scavenge it for parts. Though GM's legal department forced Smokey to cut it into four sections and provide a notarized photograph of the car, he kept the Hulk until a 1976 garage sale. That's when Corvette collectors Dick Walker and Steve Tate negotiated to buy the remains for that $7,000 price. As reported in the January 1991 issue of Corvette Fever magazine, Walker and Tate negotiated the price using hand signals as Unic was on the phone talking with somebody else. What they finally raised was seven fingers, Yunick nodded, and XP-819 was theirs. The landmark Corvette test mule has since been fully restored. Now, of course, we refer to things like XP-819, and that was one of many experimental prototype cars, XP, experimental prototype, done by Duntov and the Corvette crew. And it is true that early on, Duntov thought that the front engine of the Corvette was holding it back in the world of high-performance road racing, and he sought to go with a mid-engine and even potentially a rear-engine platform. So it's pretty cool that the Corvair development goss boss Frank Winchell decided to try a rear-engine Corvette slash Corvair car. What I'm really thrilled about is the all-aluminum 327 that they created to hang off the rear of the transaxle. You got to remember that, you know, the 327 is small and light as it was. It was made of iron. So they knew better and they said, let's make an aluminum 327. Maybe that heavy weight won't be too bad hanging off the tail. Well, of course, it was. <laughs> you know, even a Porsche flat six weighs less than aluminum V8. So undoubtedly, that Corvette test car was probably pretty tail happy and certainly would have been no good on a road race course, let alone on the showroom floor. But yeah, that car still exists today. Okay, more Corvette. Three, two. Okay, more Corvette factoids in number 94, 94, 94, 94, which reads... 1955 was a pivotal year for Corvette, and GM advertising copywriters spared no energy in describing the impact of the new for 55 265 cubic inch V8. The May 1955 issue of Motor Trend contains a full-page Corvette ad with these words, quote, There's mighty potent ammunition under the hood of the new Corvette. For now, the Blue Flame 6 is joined by a very special 195 horsepower version of the astonishing Chevrolet V8 engine. How's it go? Like the ride of the Valkyries, the takeoff of a V2 rocket, the plunge down the crest of bobsled run, all wrapped up in one. If you have never driven any Corvette, then you are to be envied. You have an experience coming, a single jubilation that will tingle you in all memory for the rest of your life. Unquote. Wow. Two things strike me today. The reference to the German V2 rocket bomb, a none too pleasant World War II image from only a decade before, and how the V8 and 6 are described as teammates. In reality, the 265 V8 replaced the aged 6. Only 7 of the 700 1955 Corvette buyers went for the 6 banger, despite the $135 price difference $2,774 for the 6 versus $2,909 for the V8. And yes, uh, over the years at Barrett-Jackson, 
we did have the pleasure of selling one of those 1955 six-cylinder Corvettes. And here's an ironic thing. Those six-cylinder Corvettes in 1955 retained the six-volt charging system seen in 53 and 54, while V8-powered Corvettes in 1955 got the 12-volt charging system. Now you know. All right, let's move from Corvette to Camaro facts for number 95. This is a quote. The Z28 was last seen in 1974 when the power and speed that emanated from its light, high-revving small-block engine was in a state of seemingly terminal decline. Rather than let the proud name become just another plastic applique on the flanks of various ordinary cars, as happened to the Pontiac GTO and Plymouth Roadrunner, Chevrolet yanked the car off the market. Now it returns in a fashion that is sure to blow the lid off the entire world, automobiles, and end once and for all the notion that Detroit and the American people have forgotten performance, end quote. Car and Driver magazine was so impressed with the reborn 1977 Z28, they put it on the cover of the April 77 issue with a Pontiac Trans Am. If only they could see what's available to today's Camaro buyer, where the base V6 generates 323 horsepower at a 69 Z28 intimidating 6,800 RPM. I mean, think about that's crazy. You know, the base Camaro engine, the V6, 323 horsepower, and that's net power. That's real horsepower. And again, 6,800 RPM. But keep in mind, today's V6 does not have push rods. These are overhead cam engines, so they have the ability to rev higher with less rotating and reciprocating mass, again, with no push rods to, to play with. But uh, we've come a long way. But back in the 70s, you know, uh, the world was a, a scary place. People were not so sure we even have V8s anymore. But here we are, you know, 40 years later in 2020 with, um, you know, 700 horsepower Camaros like it's nothing. Pretty cool. These are good times to be a performance enthusiast. Moving on to fact number 96, let's bounce from Camaros to Chevelles. This is a quote from Car Life magazine. It goes... The Chevelle SS 454-450 is then something of a high point in supercars using the original definition of an intermediate with a big powerful engine. Before deciding that things are going downhill, reflect. Things haven't gone uphill for several years. Supercars haven't been getting faster. The 1964 GTO went 14.8 at 99 miles per hour. The 70 GTO Ram Air 400 went 14.6 at 99.55 miles per hour. Better engines and tires have been countered by more weight and emissions controls. End quote. Car Life magazine was less than impressed when its 1970 LS6 Chevelle ran a 1457 at 9977 for a 1970 road test. Perhaps the test car's 331 gears had a role to play? Sure enough, you know, this quote is an interesting one because this is Car Life magazine, not super stock, hot rod, or car craft. Car Life was kind of like Motor Trend. They tested regular cars for regular people, so no doubt when they drag tested that car with 331 gears in the back, come on, no doubt that it probably had a lot of tire spin and ran that fairly tame 14.57 at 99 miles per hour. And, uh, you know, a real well-tuned LS6 454 Chevelle could have gone, you know, 13.5, a full second quicker uh, at the hands of Carcraft or, or Hot Rod, who probably would have tested it with 410 or 370 gears in the differential. But again, this was probably a cruising car ordered up with a 331 gear set in the back. But again, that LS6 454 with its 450 horsepower rating was pretty much the pinnacle of the muscle car moving. So Car Life Magazine kind of had a point. Were we going forward or backwards? And again, if they could only see what we have to play with today in 2020. Good stuff. Okay, more Chevelle trivia in fact number 97. They wouldn't print it if it weren't true, right? When reporting on a new 1965 Z16 Chevelle that arrived at Kinney Chevrolet in Brooklyn, New York, the editors of the September 1965 issue of Super Stalkers in Action magazine offered these pearls of wisdom. Quote, the engine will swing 6,500 RPM with no sweat, and if you really want to push it, you can just about make it to seven grand. And this is with the hydraulic magnesium lifters. Just think what rocker arms, magnesium connecting rods, and a good roller camshaft will do. Unquote. Magnesium, huh? Despite the technical flub, this article is one of the very few to feature the Z16 Chevelle when it was new. The photo of its Z16 Pacific 160 miles per hour speedometer alone is priceless. 
And again, Chevrolet only built 201 of those 396, 375 horsepower Z16 Chevelles in 1965. Again, it was the tip of the spear of the flood of SS 396s, which would follow from 1966 through 1971. Well, and, uh, and for super stalkers in Action Magazine to say magnesium connecting rods, what? Hydraulic magnesium lifters, what? You know, I've been a magazine writer for many, many years. And some of us, well, we're not that technical. I'm not saying I'm one of them, but for somebody to write a boo-boo like that, hydraulic magnesium lifters, you got to wonder what these guys were smoking back then in 1966. Okay, let's move from the 1960s into the 1980s with fact number 98. The 350 IROC Z was a big deal at the time, and I remember reading this review of a pre-production car in the summer 1986 issue of the short-lived Camaro Trans Am magazine. Quote, Basically, what Chevrolet did was take the short block out of the 86 Corvette, swap the aluminum heads for 85's iron heads, hang the 5-liter tune port injection exhaust system on it, add the VET's injection along with a computer management program unique to the 350 IROC. This motor in the Camaro for 87 will put out 200 horses at 4,200 RPM, 30 more than the best 86s, end quote. Again, we have some confused journalists. The actual output of the 1987 L98 350 was 225 horsepower, bumped up to 230 horsepower for 1988. To performance-starved Chevy fans, the L98 350 was as different from the 305 Cube LB9 two-port mill as a 396 big block. The L98 was a big deal. It's true. You know, here we are in 2020 with LS engines and, you know, 700 horsepower Corvettes and Camaros like nothing. But back in the 1980s, any Camaro with the, the heart of a Corvette was a really big deal. And I remember going down to the Diamond Chevrolet on Park Ave in Worcester, Massachusetts, looking at the rocker panels of the new IROC. If I saw the 5.7, I said, wow, that's a Corvette powered Camaro, the 5.7 IROC Z, because most of them, it said 5 liter TPI underneath the Z28. But if you saw the 5.7 on the rocker and also on the rear bumper, you knew you were looking with a, at a Camaro with the heart of a Corvette. They were really big deals. And today, on the auction scene, these cars are starting to rock out ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars. Now, keep in mind the best ones have to be very original or very pure in their restoration. And the uh, the one LE cars, the road race cars, those are starting to hit fifty thousand bucks for low mile examples. So we're seeing it. The the eighties performance cars are starting to heat up, and I understand it. They deserve it. Okay, let's go from the 1980s back to the 1960s with more Camaro trivia in fact number 99. This is a quote from Chevrolet General Manager Pete Estes. Quote, We only planned on selling about 400 Z28s in 1968, but instead we had orders for 7,000. Boy, there are kids out there, and they have money. And when they hear that Mark Donahue cleans up in Trans Am with a Z28, they've just got to have one for themselves. In 1969, we planned to sell 27,000, end quote. That was Chevrolet General Manager Pete Estes touting strong Z28 sales figures in the October 1968 issue of Motor Trend magazine. Today, we know that 602 orders were sold in 1967, 7,199 in 1968, and 20,302 in 1969. Of course, these are Z28 Camaro sales we're talking about. Shortly after the article was published, Estes was replaced by John DeLorean as head of the Bowtie Division. But don't feel too bad for him. He got the one and only first-generation Z28 convertible ever built. It's a 1968 and it still exists, as does a Dead Nuts Correct clone built recently by a hardcore Camaro enthusiast. Yeah, it's fun to sometimes read when factory and corporate executives kind of stick their nose into the party and remember or comment on the performance scene. Some of these guys are not car people at all, but Pete Estes surely was, as was Vince Piggins and uh, folks like John DeLorean. But uh, to, to have him record the fact that he thought that 7,000 was a big deal for 1968 Z28 sales, but if he could only have seen, you know, the 30, almost 20,000 cars for 1969. And again, the Z28 was a very limited interest car. Saw the lifters, uh, a Holly carburetor, 11 to 1 compression. It was not a car for housewives and uh, executives commuting to and from work. So when they finally sold 20,000 units in 1969, the Camaro Z28 had arrived for sure. Okay, moving from fact number 99 to fact number 100, we're turning a quarter of sorts. 
Uh, fact 100 is the final fact in my book dealing with Chevrolet. Fact number 101 and show number 7 will graduate into the world of Pontiac. Yep, Pontiacs. But for now, let's go with fact 100, the final Chevrolet fact in my book and on this podcast. And this is a quote from the January 1969 issue of Motor Trend Magazine, which reads, While performance was impressive, our fervor was really aroused by the one 1969 Chevrolet edition that is guaranteed to turn you on or you aren't a red-blooded, hairy-chested American male. It's the new chambered exhaust system and it has the mellowest rap we've heard since our last flathead Ford with dual smithies, and that was a few years ago, end quote. Yes, the editors of the January 1969 issue of Motor Trend Magazine really liked the optional NC8 straight pipes for $15.80 fitted to their SS396 Chevelle test car. Left unsaid was the dramatic impact they had on vehicle weight. Without bulky undercar mufflers, the NC8 system weighed 50 pounds less than the standard duals. Still, only 4,143 Chevelle buyers, plus 1,526 Camaro buyers, took the chambered pipe plunge. Happily, reproductions are available today for Chevelle and Camaro applications. It's true, the chambered exhaust system made by Walker for General Motors cost $15.80 and got rid of the traditional canister style mufflers and again shed 50 pounds of weight which some drag racers might have cared about. And keep in mind, 100 pounds reduced from a car will make it one tenth of a second quicker in a quarter mile, so a half a tenth would have been uh, shaved with the NC8 uh, chambered exhaust system. But what we're seeing a lot in rest restorations today is recreations or reproductions of these Walker dimpled pipes on Camaros and Chevelles. They look really cool and they do sound fantastic. At wide open, they're very loud. In fact, back in the day, these things were illegal in certain states, which is largely why sales never broke the 4,200 unit mark. Well, that's it for episode six of the Steve Maggs Muscle Car Show. We'll be back next Monday with show seven and a switch to Pontiac Facts and Trivia as we make our way through my book, Steve Mag's 1001 Muscle Car Facts. And don't forget, if you have questions or comments, hit me up at stevemags.com muscle car mailbag. For my executive producer, Chris Roberts, until next time, hasta mañana. The Steve Mag's Muscle Car Show podcast is brought to you by High Octane Classics, the Northeast's largest muscle car and supercar dealership located at 143 Washington Street in Auburn, Massachusetts. High Octane Classics buys and sells and services muscle cars and exotics. Call them at 508-859-4515.